there is a bit of urgency because it, it's clear that the right now the attackers have gotten a bit of the upper hand. They, they, there's a lot of technology advancement that helps the attacker to bypass the, the, the phishing filters. The AI is happily helping the attackers to, to craft beautiful letters, phishing emails. So if there is a, a need to kind of continue in the improvement journey and continue in the resilience. And this is a quite good tool in your toolbox. This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff, and there's no Jim today. He is on assignment. Uh, I've given him a vacation. He's in lovely Chicago, hopefully getting some portillos, maybe some shaku. Uh, but you've got just me today, but I'm not alone. I've got my friend Martin. He's going to join us here in a second. But before I do that, I want to, again, thank everybody for reaching out over the last uh, week or so since we put out our fifth year anniversary episode. Uh, it's been very great and very humbling to read. Uh, a lot of the comments have been out there, so definitely appreciate that. And we're going to just keep the train rolling. So um, before we get too far along, do want to mention that we are partnered up with the Identity Week conference uh, that's happening later this year. So uh, we have uh, America, which is September 11th and 12th. That's in D.C. Jim and I are both going to be at that. And uh, hopefully people can attend and come see us. Um, I'm going to be doing some sort of panel to be determined. We'll figure that out. And we'll probably be doing podcast things. Uh, and then there's also the one in Asia, in Singapore, which is October 22nd and 23rd. We've got discount codes for that. IDAC30 gets you 30% off of your registration. So hopefully people could take advantage of that and come out and see us at one of those. Uh, we'll also be at Authenticate in October. Still working on the discount code for that and get that published as soon as we've got it. Uh, but lots of opportunities to come see us. And let's see what else. Uh, there's also some regional events taking place for Identiverse uh, in November, I believe, in both New York City and Chicago. Um, I may or may not be attending one or both of those. We'll see how things go, uh, but want to make people aware of that. I did go to the one last year in New York City, and I thought it was great. I think it was the first time they had done that. So uh, kudos to Cyber Risk Alliance and uh, you know putting that kind of stuff out there. I think it's great when we get like identity meetups happening. So um, I'm talking a mile a minute, so let's get right into it as we uh, introduce our guest today. His name is Martin Sandrin. He's the IM product lead for IKEA. Welcome to the show, Martin. Thank you very much. I'm one of your listeners. I'm very happy to be on the actual show. <laughs> well, I, I understand this is probably a career highlight from you and, and being on the podcast and you're joining us from the Netherlands and in Amsterdam, I believe is what we had established and you're seven hours ahead. So you're coming to us from the future, so to speak. Um, tell us a little bit about Martin. How did you get into the world of identity and access management? Yeah, so I actually landed in this because when I was at university, so I'm originally from Sweden, so I went to university in Sweden, and, and uh, I started working as a, a system administrator in the labs. And uh, I was supposed to be a chemical engineering major, but then I found computers more fun than, than distilling towers, so I switched over to computer science. And then when I did my uh, my thesis work, I was looking at integrating ERP systems with LDAP authentication, externalized authentication. And then I kind of landed into the, the world of security and ERP systems and then let, took a, a job in Germany and then I went into to, uh, consulting in the uh, IM space back in 2005 and uh, started doing implementation of Tor Accelerate which uh, a little bit later became OIM, and then I got stuck. <laughs> you got stuck, but now, you, and now you're with IKEA working on IAM stuff there. How long total have you been in the identity space? So a little bit how we count, but about 15 to 20 years, if you count when I did a little bit of other things than just IAM as well. But quite a long okay. time now. Is there anything from your chemical engineering background that you think has translated to the identity space? Well, it's interesting because some of the stuff that you do in, in AI, for example, how you use um, machine learning and, and peer, it's actually 
stuff that was kind of invented for how to optimize chemical um, chemical engineering and filler towers, for example, back in the late 19th century. But when you don't really have a clue of how anything works, you can use these data points and peer, peer, uh, peering to figure out how to get some form of a control of a, a sample and of outcomes. Hmm. So it's a little bit useful, although not very useful. <laughs> useful for other things maybe, but I think some of the lessons probably hopefully will apply. It's interesting about the AI parallel that you're drawing. Uh, I know we're going to talk about pass keys and we didn't really kind of talk about this ahead of time, but give me your thoughts real quickly on AI in the identity space. Uh, where do you see things currently and where do you think they go or where do you want them to go maybe from an AI perspective? Well, I think you have the, the kind of the, the cop and the consigliere concept. So, um, we want to use the AI to, for, to focus limited resources on the right things. Um, so for example, you can use that to, to focus in on the right recertifications that are out of band, or you can help in ITDR like cases where you really want that your, your limited SOC resources focus on the most interesting cases. There's also the, the, the use cases where you see, uh, for example, generating descriptions of groups and similar things. So I do think that there's some quite interesting parts, but it's also a little bit like, you know, a couple of years ago, everything was zero trust. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it does right now, it, it kind of more helps the attackers in some ways. Uh, for example, uh, with AI, you can write beautiful, uh, really nice. Uh, phishing letters, and also in languages that didn't exist before. Um, for example, some Icelandic banks that discovered that suddenly it was financially feasible to write phishing letters in Icelandic with AI translations. So uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how it's going to help the defense as well. Yeah, I think there's a there's a lot of runway in the book is just starting to get you know written on this topic. So I'm always curious when I talk with others in this space of you know, where they think things are going or what, the, what they're kind of seeing in the real world. Um, I do want to talk about pass keys, though, because I think that's really kind of be the main thrust of our conversation. And you presented at EIC just last month around this topic. I guess let's give, let's start with your general thoughts around pass keys. You know, is it hype? Is it real? Where do you stand right now? So, so again, I think it's a quite wide kind of topic, and it's, it's still very, very early game. In, with real implementations. If you look at what, what we have been using it for, it's primarily in kind of a proof of concept approach to see, can it be used to provide more efficient resistance for the high and highest admins? So of course you have a situation where, you know, MFA has become ambiguous, like everyone, like you can't have a PAM system where you don't have MFA application today. It's not, you know, it won't really be a serious system. But uh, the, the interesting part there is, of course, that some of the technologies that I think, at least me, I thought that uh, the the push technology was really strong. Why would you need anything more? But what we are seeing is that the SMS has been defeated. There's just a lot of different attacks, and and you can add uh, all the operational problems. You can get the SMS. If you look at push. There's a number of ways that you can overwhelm a, a person or an admin. Um, so the phishing resistance of, of push technologies with the apps and similar is limited. So then you, of course, start looking at alternatives. And there you have things like hardware keys, which are great, but of course, very expensive. And not only because they cost some money to actually purchase, but primarily because they are expensive to distribute. Uh, and it's a little bit of, I remember like 15 years ago when everyone had the, the little generators from RSA and similar, and you spent a lot of your, your time on kind of distributing those uh, across global companies. It's a nightmare for me that I re re relive trying to distribute uh, RSA tokens to people and yeah. seed files and what happens when you need to replace it. Just, yeah, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> yeah. And it's, of course, when you're a global company, then 
you kind of need to to figure out a way to support this global. And of course, there are companies that can help you with this as well. But it's it's quite large investment. And then you always have the discussion, especially um, everyone is trying to make sure to control costs and adding a quite expensive technology uh, is something that people are really reluctant to do, of course. Mm -hmm. So with the, the pass keys, and uh, of course, there's lots of different use cases for it, but what we looked at was basically to see, can we use this as a way to provide better, stronger phishing resistance compared to what you have from a, a authentication app uh, at a, still a, a more uh, quite a low cost uh, compared to rolling out hardware keys. And uh, that's been quite an interesting journey. Of course, some of it, um, it's just become generally available. Um, and uh, when we did the, the piloting, uh, one thing we saw is that you require quite new mobile phones. So the OS needs to be very kind of fresh. And of course, that's an important lessons learned because if you have this in your plan, uh, one of the things you should look for is to see you know, how much of the phones that your company gives out can actually support this. And if that percentage is relatively low, then either wait a little while or start notifying your, your mobile phone department that you're going to have to do some refresh and get people some newer phones. And usually, especially if it kind of target a higher, high and higher, highest, uh, it's usually quite limited amount of people and perhaps they're quite happy about the cost of getting a new phone. So. Mm -hmm. It's nice for your poor users for once. I, you know, I'm curious. I want to touch on that fact real quick because I'm always curious how phones make it into the corporate or business world for other regions. I'll give you my perspective in the U.S. And this is something that I hear a lot when I'm working with clients and stuff like that. Is well, this idea that if the company is going to make me use my phone for something, then they should pay for it whether it's the phone itself or the service. And I found that that has stopped quite a few companies from rolling out, you know, push notification for MFA via an app or even pass keys and kind of things like that, where it's just this, it's just this sentiment in the US, it seems, where there are a certain part of the population that has that feeling that, well, if the company's making me do this, then they should pay for that. Is that a similar thing that you experience in, in your region or is it a little bit different? It it, it's definitely, um, and of course, if you're in a unionized country, either if you're a unionized shop in the U.S. or if you're in, a, in for example, in certain markets like Germany, where the, there's very strong unions, unless the company pays for the phone, th there's no ability to, you, would al you always have to provide a, an alternative for your employees or and your contractors to the, the phone. Mm -hmm. And that is, I would say, if the... The, the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges that you have when you try to roll out MFA uh, in a global company. Mm -hmm. And then you also have the fact that in, in certain regions, smartphones aren't the standard yet. There, there are certain regions where, that, where SMS is okay, but if you say that you need to have a smartphone, then they go like, yeah, but people don't have that yet. Um, uh, and so it's, it's important to go out and, and ask around your different areas to see you know, in the Middle East or in China, is what is really acceptable to your population. And I think that's something that probably people should be thinking about here is pass keys are not a binary thing, right? It's another option for an organization yeah. to leverage, to provide to their users or customers or whatever it may be, that I don't think we're at the point yet <laughs> where only pass keys is the solution that is actually viable in the real world. No, the, what we, <clears throat> our experience was that about, if you look at our population of mobile phones, only about 30% of them actually supported passkeys. Now, of course, that is improving month by month as we roll in newer and newer phones. And um, again, people can probably survive that they get a bit newer phones, if, as long as you have the, the financial planning for it. Uh, but today, I, I would say that's definitely a, a a big challenge if you would start rolling it out on, on broad front. Yeah, I mean, that's a big expense to put out there. I mean, it went from, you know, typically like a 30 to maybe $60 RSA token, depending on your bulk pricing, yeah. to a, what, 700 
plus, maybe 500 plus, you know, bare minimum smartphone. That's a pretty big difference in pricing that if you're required to provide that to, you know, your workers, I, I can see how that might be a roadblock. <laughs> Yeah, and the the total cost of uh, providing a mobile phone can easily be fifty dollars, perhaps even hundred dollars if you uh, take the entire cost. So, of course, you're talking yeah. about a broad <clears throat> a broad rollout. That is a lot of money for a big company. Yeah, so that's a pretty big bet to place on pass keys. I'm wondering, um, you know, what are some of the other challenges? I think the phone typically is the first one that comes up. Uh, maybe there's other things like applications or remote desktop scenarios, things like that, that maybe you've seen some, some issues around. One thing we saw was, and this is, seems to be quite random, um, depending on how the application is packaged, we have seen running into problems with Teams specifically, which just seems to be a packaging question. So an important lesson learned there is just to do a pilot and roll it out to the kind of a representative population that you want to have it on and see what kind of problems they run into and let them run for a few weeks and see. Um, the other thing we saw was that, and this is of course a classical problem, uh, that when we talk about anything that has to do with remote desktop, that has always been a, a challenge for, uh, for pass keys or you know physical keys or anything. And of course that is then very important because of course, what if you want to use this for a higher highest, uh, they usually do some form of remote desktop. And if that doesn't work, then it's not very useful. We also saw that the, the, it still seems that the, the kind of the usability is slightly better for the, the hardware keys. So it's another factor. Um, there is also a little bit of, of challenge. You have to write good manuals because it, Sometimes uh, I think we concluded that you have to still have the authenticator there as a backup, otherwise bad things start happening. <laughs> so I think the main thing, if you're interested in this, start with a, a pilot, uh, investigate how many people's, whose phones is, is actually working with, and then also make sure that you try out all of your the more important applications to see that they actually work. You mentioned the usability component, and this is something that, you know, I, I work in identity and I struggle with this sometimes is I have multiple pass keys for my Google account, for example, based on whatever device I happen to create them. It might be on my MacBook, it might be on my phone, it might be in my, uh, you know, password wallet or, you know, whatever it may be. And I can see that being very confusing for people where it's like, okay, well, where did I store my pass key? And it seems to me like that's off an awful lot of like, okay, well, that's another password somewhere. <laughs> Maybe it's not yeah. a string that you have to remember, but it's like you have to remember where you put it and you know what device you used. Do you run into that uh, scenario? Yes, and also that uh, if you look at it, uh, there is a lot of people who wants to be the the single thing that rules them all. So mm -hmm. if you have some form of a a password vault like application, many of them are also targeting of being working in different ways with the pass keys. And then you, you kind of have an explosion in complexity, an explosion in, in kind of, how do I explain this? Uh, and especially if you're at many global companies like us, we have five major help desks. <laughs> so you have to make sure that all everyone is informed about this because of course it doesn't take many, especially if we're talking about an admin in the tail deployment, for example, because the person couldn't get in that becomes a big issue quite quickly. Yeah, I thought about this before, and I remember thinking back to an early um, consumer identity conference, I think, uh, uh, by Cooper and Nicole several years back, and somebody came up to me from like a password uh, vault vendor and asked me what I thought about that. And this was probably four or five years ago. And I said, and I, I, you know, I feel I feel bad about this answer, so I'm I'm putting it out there. And I think I've said it before. Is like I just don't know how a password vault survives if we are in this world where there's no passwords. And now that we're here, five years later, now I see. Oh, well, wait a second. We need something to synchronize pass keys between devices. And I think that's an area where a vendor neutral platform like a password vault can be handy for people to say, okay, you know, here's a standardized way that. You know, maybe if I'm rolling out to this a company and I want everybody to use LastPass or Bitwarden or 
you know, name your password vault of choice if they support pass keys, does it make it easier to say, hey, here's the process. Store your pass keys here. They work across devices and try to avoid some of the confusion that goes along with, well, is this in my iCloud keychain or is this in my Windows TPM chip? Is this in, you know, in the Android, you know, store or whatever it might be? I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so it's uh, yet another case where something has kind of reinvented themselves. And of course, this is an important part of your security standards as well. So if you're using this for um, the high and highest, then perhaps device bound is the right way to go. Uh, that, of course, also then means that the question comes in in, um, you know, once we have this in place, is the attack path that is going to come in now, is it going to be the bind and rebind of, of pass keys and, and uh, application devices to the user? So the, the, and that then highlights the need for the, the service desk and how do they authenticate the user? Of course, now that we're kind of past COVID, uh, people can come into the office and then they can show a physical ID, et cetera. Um, so that's become a little bit better, but there's still a lot of people who might be working quite far away from the closest physical help desk. And then you have to figure out a way to do remote authentication. Of course, in, the, in Europe, uh, every, all the light is coming towards the, the, the wallet. So perhaps that is the solution to that specific problem. I know. Yeah, I guess it's, it's an interesting evolution, maybe, of that solution and that technology. Um, what are, I, we, we, I feel like this has been a negative conversation only from the fact of like, we've talked about the challenges, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like this thing is not easy yet. It's, it, there's many things still to overcome that are absolutely real, real world problems that we need to solve for. But let's talk some of the benefits, you know, what do you see as some of the things that maybe, you know, your users or you've seen out in, you know, in, in your world that have benefited people to say, oh, yeah, this Pasky thing is great, you know, and here's the benefit it provided. So I, I think from our perspective, it's mostly that it's a, it's a financially viable alternative to hardware keys for admins uh, and to get a phishing resistant solution in place. And I, I definitely think this is something that is the, in, in many cases, we are very close to, if you look at the, the challenges, they are becoming smaller and smaller per month. So come, come fall, uh, we're probably going to see, you know, 50% of the, the phones being able to support it. Of course, depends on how quickly you have your turnovers that's run. Um, so at that point, this is a really good idea. To compare to continuing using, you know, SMS or authentication apps or equivalent, at least for some of the the really high admins, and provided that that your applications can actually support it, then um, and perhaps you don't do it on your your. Um, in many cases, you want to do a, a separation anyway between your your personal account that you do all your, you know, email reading and web browsing and stuff and your admin account. And then the, your admin account, you might not be using that many applications there. You know, you, you're, if you're a, a primarily a, a Nash or Entra admin, that is what you primarily do, or you log into your PAM solution, that's the only thing you do with that account. So being able to lift in you know, a cost efficient manner, the security of for that, those kind of logins and making it really a lot more phishing resistant. That is a huge boon, and especially in you know tough times when budgets might not be as easy to get to. Not having to to make a large investment in hardware keys and getting all the logistics working, that's it's a, a significant improvement at a relatively small investment. If I never have to send a hardware token again out in the real world, I would be very happy about that. That's a a pain and suffering I don't wish on any of my fellow ID administrators of. And they're having to do that today. Um, what about some other things? So you mentioned kind of like the the administrative use case. Um, is there a customer thing here that you know it's it's going to be easier maybe for customers to come in? Because I think about it from two different lenses. One is you know the internal workforce, whether that's employees, contractors, or any partners and things like that. And then I think about this as a consumer and say, okay, well, you know, I have a password wallet that has 
thousands <laughs> of user accounts in there. And I'm constantly being asked to rotate passwords and things like that. Do you see an opportunity maybe for, you know, the consumer side of the world to adopt this maybe and help with that messaging so that it becomes more well-known and it becomes a thing that's like, oh yeah, remember this, you know, this thing that was kind of new? Everybody's doing it. Kind of like a face ID or a touch ID or other biometric approaches. So I definitely think so. If you look at, of course, a little bit the challenge here is that you see, a, I think you still see a quite kind of divergence in different worlds that you have a, 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 an Apple world and a Microsoft world, et cetera. They, I think that part is going to be kind of first coming to more advanced users. And of course, it depends a little bit of what kind of, of consumers you have. If you have a high security solution, like financial services or equivalent, then you're probably going to have this earlier, but then you might already have a, a standardized solution for it that's more secure. Um, it's definitely something I would expect coming in as a standard part of, of CM solutions, again, probably from, from the fall or from next year, and that people start kind of using it. Um, and in that setup, there's there's assuming that you're, you have a modern CM solution that supports, there's not a huge, a lot of downside of supporting it next to the passwords. Mm -hmm. Um, so of course it's just a little bit more straightforward and you, you eliminate the risk of credential stuffing. Um, of course you could say, okay, what's different if I have, I, I generate a strong password and my, my, uh, password manager in my, in my browser anyway. Is there a huge difference? And that's, of course, debatable. But there is uh, definitely a, a consumer, you know, customer use case as well. So I, wanna, I want to have you put on your future prediction hat and tell me, when do you think we'll see you know, something that's like AI related to pass keys? <laughs> we talked about earlier, I was like, well, you know, everything's AI and it was zero trust was a couple of years ago. Like, do you see an opportunity for AI to help in any way with some of the passkey deployment? And I think we can, anything is on the table as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, so, so I think what we usually look at when we think about this is, you know, again, the COP and consigliere. So I definitely think that the, the consigliere will keep track of all of your passkeys and mm -hmm. make sure that you, you know, where did I, which, where did I put this, this passkey that I was supposed to find and figure that part out? Um, so I, I do think that there is some, some AI parts to this as well. I'm waiting for the, like the, the logo on somebody's product that says, you know, such and such authentication now with 50% more AI, <laughs> right. Or something like that. That's trying to get on the hype train, uh, for this type of thing. Um, one other thing that I think I want to get into is around, you know, you, you've, so you're doing this in the real world, you're testing this out. Is there anything that's surprising that you've come up with? It's like, oh, I wasn't expecting that when you started on this journey of passwordless. So, so I think one thing that surprised me was that the, the, you required such a new OS, like mm -hmm. the fact that my my phone, my private phone that is only like six months, it's not supporting it yet. That was not something I had expected to run in as a major challenge, um, and it, it's a little bit. Well, at least to me, it was surprising that you needed to have a really new OS to be able to run it in Android, for example. And basically, at least when we looked at this three months ago, it was almost like it was only the Google phones that had it supported on a broad front. So that was one surprise. Uh, I was also surprised about the fact that the the, the uh, application packaging system matter. Uh, that is not something I would have expected. Yeah, talk to me about that application packaging. You mentioned it before, and I think, give me, can you talk a bit more specifically about like, what is the challenge there that, that we need to overcome still as an industry? So, and I have to admit that we didn't really figure out exactly why we run into problems. It seems that, so of course, like most enterprises, we, we package applications before we push them out to, to our users. Mm -hmm. And it seemed that certain ways of when we packaged up certain applications was not uh, was not compatible with the, the pass keys, which is not something I would have expected. Um, so that was a surprise to me, at least. Hmm. Do you think that's something uh, that's like OS specific or app specific, seems, or maybe we just don't it, know yet? It, maybe it's both. 
it's a little bit unclear, but it seems that if you also how it's installed, if it's installed as admin, uh, requires, then it works. Or I have to admit, we never figured out why it didn't work. We just concluded that it didn't work and um, that the next phase is to sit down and, and see uh, if we can get these a few remaining applications. But again, um, I think for at least initial use, it, it's mostly about the, the PAM and there, well, they, the, the high and, high and highest admin. And uh, mm -hmm. there it's mostly about how you handle remote workstations. That is a, a big problem uh, for us at least. Well, we've got a lot of listeners all around the world, so maybe we can crowdsource this and you yeah. know, we'll have a, a link to your, your LinkedIn profile in our show notes, maybe if mm -hmm. there's advice. At the risk of killing Martin's inbox, you know, if there's ideas, maybe they can reach out with uh, you know, potential solutions. <laughs> Sounds like a great idea. <laughs> All right. So you've you've taken this journey on. You're just kind of getting started. What's a piece of advice that you would give to people out there who are in your shoes and they're like, okay, this pasky thing sounds interesting. What's something that I should be thinking about? So the first part is to see if, if you have a, a um, some form of a CMDB or management of, of mobile phones. See how many of the mobile phones that are given out by your company are actually supporting it. Hmm. That's a good starting point. Uh, the second thing is to kind of perhaps put out some messages in the Slack channels, whatever you use for, and then suddenly people come bouncing up and says that they want to be part of the, the pilot. And um, that's a good way to get a, a, an enthusiastic testing course. And then just try it out. Um, also one thing, one, eternal challenge in an enterprise is, is how do you handle service accounts? So that's another interesting part, or perhaps this perhaps is a part of the solution to the problem as well. That you can, it's, a, it's a problem that you need, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 solutions because there's no killer bullet that solves all the application teams need for having some form of a, a workable solution that's both secure and works in their environment with the the specific setup they have. Uh, so that's another important thing. And then try it out and be ready to kind of roll it back if it turns out that it doesn't work for the, the pilot force that you have. Yeah, make sure you can recover <laughs> if you need to, right? Yeah. Don't delete that password just yet. We're not quite there yet. You need somewhere to recover uh, to go through yep. that process. All right, so those are things that people should be thinking about. Let me put you on the spot here. What's something that people should absolutely not be doing? Like, is there something that's like, oh yeah, we tried that and my experience, that is not a good idea. Or maybe just a general rule of thumb is, you know, yeah, definitely don't do I, that. I just would say definitely don't just kind of say, well, today now we have passkeys, their entire company, please stop using them. Uh, <laughs> then you're going to get a lot of people who's going to go, but, but my phone doesn't support this. <laughs> um, uh, and the, the, the usability of these, these kind of flows and, and journeys is not really where they should be. So you kind of need to have users that are very uh, forgiving for, uh, for problems uh, to do this. So I, I would not roll it out on a broad front just yet. Uh, it probably takes a bit more, bit more versions before that is clear. Yeah, dip um, your toe in the water a little bit, maybe not jump full, yeah. full swing. Yeah. But I, I do think it's a good idea to start trying this because it 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 does improve your your uh, fishing resistance quite a lot at a, a cost that is carryable by the company. And that's a that's a great goal to strive for. I think you know the more we're fishing resistant methods we have out there, I think the better for everybody. Yeah, it obviously helps the user from their account security. It helps support desks and trying to reclaim those, and obviously the costs associated with organizations and you know, data and stuff like that. So uh, definitely supportive of that. So yeah, and else? I think that's that's an important part. If, if you look at how you combat the attackers, um, a lot of it is just trying to start walking towards both increasing your fishing resistance and start putting little speed bumps in front of the attacker that you will not, today you will not be able to kind of build a, the perfect kind of castle that no one will break into. but. If you do, for example, you know, look at, at your Active Directory and say, okay, how do I manage my entitlements? Could it be that I could move from a kind of 
organic entitlement model where you're kind of giving out entitlements a little bit, you know, piece by piece to a more structured model where you go towards least privilege, at least vaguely reasonable privileges most of the time. Um, and that you kind of do things like separating your, your normal account from your admin account. Those things does make it much harder for attacker. Uh, it means that they have to spend more time trying to crack the next layer. And also it means that they, they take them more time and you generate more signal. So it gives the, the cybersecurity teams a lot more chances to, to pick up on the attack. Yeah, so, I feel like this is an area where the, and, I, and I'm going to ask you if this is something that makes sense in, in your region, is what we say sometimes in the U.S. is you want to be faster. You don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to be faster than your friends. <laughs> to a, a large degree, that's very true uh, also here in Europe uh, and uh, in, I think globally. Uh, and also just trying to continuously kind of move move forward and, and do, you know, a thousand small steps get you. It's more of the, the, the tortures probably beats the hair in this case. That's a good analogy. Um, I mentioned early on that you had presented on this topic at uh, the European um, uh, conference for by the Martin Kupinger puts out for Kupinger Cole. Did we, is there anything that we missed from this conversation that you think is worth like people understanding and kind of getting out there and, and, Part sharing your wisdom on this? No, it was a quite interesting. It was a very full room, which is always nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got E. Mahler was doing the was the moderator, which also was nice. That's great. He's um, awesome. uh, yeah, uh, yes. Uh, and um, I think this is a very interesting topic that is going to really kind of become real, and we're going to see more and more implementations during the the next six to 12 months. Um, and there is a bit of urgency because it, it's clear that the right now the attackers have gotten a bit of the upper hand. They, they, there's a lot of technology advancement that helps the attacker to bypass the, the, the phishing filters. The AI is happily helping the attackers to, to craft beautiful letters, phishing emails. So it, there is a, a need to kind of continue in the improvement journey and continue in the resilience. And this is a quite good tool in your toolbox. Yeah, I mean, this is an area that I think is really just starting to kind of explode. And I'm sure we'll hear more about it at the FIDO Authenticate conference later this year. Uh, you know, hats off to them for getting Microsoft, Google, and Apple all on the same table to kind of figure this out. Yep. I think for the longest time, yeah, that was that was a struggle, but. We're finally coming together, right, as a group uh, to try and make this better for everybody, both from a security, but also from a usability standpoint. Uh, I want to close the conversation out with something that you told me right before we hit record. Uh, you know, we end on a show on a lighter note, and you mentioned a moose tower. And I was like, all right, we have to talk about that on, on the show. Tell me about your moose tower. <laughs> so I'm originally from Sweden. And in, in Sweden, there's a lot of, of woods and not very many people. And if you're from the more rural part of Sweden, there is something called the moose hunting season. So it's one week and it's different weeks in different parts of Sweden. And basically a, a large part of the rural population, they then sit for a week uh, with a high powered rifle and look through moose. Uh, and then you sit in one of these towers. And a few years ago, my, my son wanted a, a, uh, a swing. And I could, of course, my backyard, and I live in Amsterdam, so my backyard is very, very small. <laughs> um, and uh, I was thinking I could go and buy a, a swing set, but hey, I found these nice um, blueprints from uh, for how to build a moose hunting tower instead. Uh, in the, there's a Swedish organization that tries to promote building with lumber, so they have all of these 3D drawings and everything. And uh, I, my, I managed to convince my wife that I was allowed to build a moose hunting tower. So this was during COVID. So I started happily building it. And uh, she was probably thinking that she will never be able to do it. But uh, now it's there. So it's, um, and, uh, it's about uh, two meters high and, uh, well, say, four square meters or so. Uh, and uh, it's now been promoted from uh, being a swing set, still a swing set under the moose tower. And then 
it's also been uh, it's just now as I, I strawberry and and uh, potato growing towers have a vertical farming. Uh, it's important when you have a very small backyard that uh, my my wife is American and she has her her small uh, patch of grass that she can enjoy her suburbia and then I am my potato and the uh, and, uh, strawberry dro- growing moose hunting towers. <laughs> and you got this in the in your backyard in the Amsterdam area. And I guess for I'm trying to think of the conversion. So two meters is about like what six and a half feet or so for the people who are in the U.S. on the six feet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so like that. So that's pretty high off the ground. Um, yeah, either... so, so it's probably not. I managed. I, I asked the neighbor if I was allowed to build, and I said yes. But they didn't probably understand what the moose hunting tower was, so they didn't <laughs> say anything about it. They probably went to uh, crazy, like, but... "What moose? There's no moose around here." <laughs> yes. So, so it's a little bit that you walk around in this moose hunting tower when you bought real potatoes, and you kind of can look in on all of the neighbors. And, um, but uh, of course, when you live in uh, the the houses are quite high, the you know the Dutch style uh, high house, so everyone can look in in everyone's backyards anyway. So, mm-hmm. how long did it take you to build it? So it turned out that the hardest part was the fact that my house is about one meter below sea level, and it's built on sand. Mm-hmm. So the 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 groundwater is very high. So it took me. Uh, two weekends to build it. One weekend to to do the the piling. So there's the 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 two meter high tower also goes about one and a half meter down into the ground. And that and you, and did you do this by yourself? Did you have friends help? Uh, I, uh, I your son dropped in? my my <laughs> I dropped in my wife to do a bit of it, but it was mostly about driving the. You put the you take the 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 two and a half meter long big pieces of wood, and then you put a half meter of a steel foot onto it, and then you start digging it out first, and then you drive it down. And it stood now for four years, so it's a very stable whistling tower. Interesting. So if you were in Sweden, is this pretty similar to what you'd see there? It would it be more like it would be taller, it would be bigger. Like talk to me about like the Swedish it's, version of it. I guess not Swedish version, but you know what I mean? Like if it was in Sweden. <laughs> So it, it's built actually from the standard pattern for building these towers. It's it's probably built a little bit more uh, robust than normally because normally you build these with kind of leftover lumber you happen to have uh, hanging around. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but otherwise it's very similar. It's it's also about so of course one part of having a moose hunting tower is that you can see the moose, but the other part is that when you hunt moose, they are very large. They they weigh in like a full bore, a full grown. Uh, bull might weigh in at like 1,200 pounds or so. Mm. So you need a very high power rifle with dumb dumb bullets to actually stop them. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, if you sit in a tower, you have a, a downward trajectory of the bullet, which is very good because if you would be sitting and, and shooting normally, could the bullet could go like a kilometer after the boost, and that mm-hmm. could be potentially very bad for anything else that happens yeah. against pot. So. <laughs> By putting the the shooters a bit up, then they just hit them into the dirt behind the moose. I, they miss it. I think a, another value add that you've gotten out of this, you start to think about, is you know you've got almost it sounds like the beginnings of a perfect zombie apocalypse like retreat where you know you've got the high ground and you've got yeah. some area. And maybe you can expand your moose tower to have like you know some more rooms to it. <laughs> Yeah, I was. Uh, tr- I'm trying to convince my wife that I'm allowed to build a a, a missile silo that can dig <laughs> downwards. That's not a thing people do um, in the center of Amsterdam. They you can't really build anything up above ground. So just like in the center of of, of uh, London, there's a lot of people who dig deep downwards to get mm-hmm. more volume. Yeah, sometimes you hear these stories of like tunnels being done underneath the city, and just, yeah. I mean, I can't imagine. You know the effort that it takes to do that, <laughs> and then I don't know the danger. I guess I'd be afraid like something would collapse on top of me, or you know instability in the buildings ahead, of, you know above me, or whatever it might be. Um, I'll stick to my, you know, I, I I like the first floor. I'm good with that. <laughs> Maybe I'll get in the second or third, and you know be fine with that. But when we start talking about going underground, that's not an area that I'm that I'm super interested in. <laughs> it's a little bit uh, more dangerous. Well, you're braver than I am, and thank you so much for taking the time to to share your wisdom with us on this. 
I'm really excited to see kind of where pass keys end up. I feel like it's been hyped now for a couple of years, but we're now starting to see it hit sort of the real world and, you know, real people in the real world are starting to, you know, look at it, use it, deploy it, kick the tires and find the issues because we have to find those issues to fix them. And so I'm, I'm really excited that you're able to take some time with us. And I know that it's you're seven hours ahead. So you're approaching, let's see about 10 30 PM roughly. So it's quite late, I would imagine, for you, and want to make sure you get out on time. Yeah, sounds great. Well, thank you very much for having me, and uh, thank you very much for all your hard work with keeping this uh, podcast on air. <laughs> well, thank you so much for listening, and thank you to everyone else uh, that listens as well. Hit that like and subscribe button. That's the best way you can help the show. Uh, we're on the web, idcpodcast.com. We're on Twitter or X, whatever it's called. By the time you listen to this or watch it, IDC Podcast. Let's see, we're on YouTube and I'm in the process of trying to set up some DNS entries. So I think I've got idacpodcast.tv will take you right to our, our YouTube channel to try and make it easier for people to find. And of course, connect with Jim and I on LinkedIn. You know, he had the day off today. He's off in Chicago, hopefully getting uh, some Pertillo's chocolate cake and uh, enjoying that while he's there. And he'll be back uh, for a future episode when we we'll record it next week. So with that, we'll go ahead and leave it. Thanks, everybody, for watching and or listening, and we'll talk with you all in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.